So GNOME 48 is out, or it should be in a matter of hours depending on when I finish this video and when you watch it. And it is, for once, a pretty big version of GNOME. You get some new digital well-being features, you get a lot of under the hood stuff for the compositor and the desktop, including HDR, triple buffering, and a lot of other things by default. And you also get some new apps, a bunch of new settings. It is a major version. So let's take a look at everything that changed right after this message from our sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, your all-in-one platform to create, manage, and publish your own website. Squarespace has really easy tools to make sure anyone can end up with a nice-looking, well-optimized website, no matter if they know how to code or not. They have what they call their blueprint system, which lets you pick from a variety of templates that are pre-built and will suit any type of website, whether it's a simple blog, an online store, a video platform, whatever. On top of that, to go further, Squarespace has their own design engine to create your own pages. You can just drag and drop elements where you want them, and you can change the colors, the fonts, and just tweak the template however you want. And once you have something you like, you can add extra features like creating your own online shop, complete with a payment system that handles credit cards, PayPal, Apple Pay, and more. So check out squarespace.com slash the Linux experiment. The link is in the description so you can give Squarespace a shot and you'll also get 10% off your first website or domain name purchase. Now I tested everything on real hardware, but for easier recording, I recorded in VirtualBox using GNOME OS, which is that development only distro that lets you try out GNOME first. There might be some segments recorded from Fedora Rawhide on actual hardware for the stuff I can't show you in a VM. So the first thing you might notice here are the fonts. They've been all replaced from Cantorel and the basic monospace font towards Advaita. This is a inter-inspired font. They as far as I can tell, only replaced one lowercase l letter, so it doesn't look like an uppercase l or, an, uh, or lowercase i, but generally it's inter. It looks much, much better than Cantorel ever did. I think it's more precise, it's less childish. The font uses, as far as I can tell, less space uh, horizontally. I just really like it. I always use inter on every single one of my computers, so this change, to me at least, is really good. Now the other thing that you'll notice quickly is that notifications are now grouped per application. For example, here in GNOME software, notifications are grouped and you can unfold them by clicking on this little down arrow and re-collapse them by clicking on this one. You can dismiss them all by clicking on the X or dismiss them individually by clicking on its individual icon. I think it looks nice. It's much better than having a long, long list of notifications stacked in here. And generally, I think it's a good change. It's a lot easier to manage. Now you also get a lot of stuff under the hood in Mutter, the compositor slash window manager. The big one is triple buffering. This is a patch that has been applied by Ubuntu and other distros for a long, long time, but that had never really been upstreamed to GNOME. What it does is basically lets you have really responsive and really smooth frame rates on older computers that have less powerful integrated GPUs. Think Raspberry Pi, think older integrated Intel GPUs where GNOME could feel stuttery and not really responsive. And now with triple buffering, it finally feels right at home. It's smooth, it's nice, and it's gonna change things for a lot of people. Another thing I can't show you is HDR support. Technically, my monitor is HDR capable and my TV as well, but no matter what I tried, I could not find the HDR experimental preference that I have to enable, and I could not find the command line in GNOME Display Control, which is a new command line utility you can use to configure your displays. But GNOME 48 does have experimental support for HDR, you might have to reuse the command line, your display might have to support a very specific version or set of HDR. Mine clearly didn't and I couldn't make it work, but technically it's there. And on that note, that new utility GDCTL for GNOME Display Control is now here. You can use it to show various display configurations and you can also use it to set various properties and preferences. So it will list all the displays, the current display mode and the various uh, values like, for example, the luminance or basically the brightness of your display. I 
don't have a use for it, but it's here and it should work better than the previous set of tools that GNOME relied upon. Another interesting change in Matter is how it handles secondary GPUs. If you have an external monitor connected to that secondary GPU, frame rates should be much, much better when using GNOME on that external display. Uh, it's basically the case if you have a hybrid graphics laptop with an integrated Intel or AMD GPU and a dedicated GPU. If you plug your external monitor to a port that is hardwired to your dedicated GPU, GNOME could have a bunch of issues in terms of performance and frame rates, and these should now be fixed, which is, for me at least, a major, major change. GNOME 48 also implemented the cursor shape Wayland protocol, meaning that cursor themes should now behave more normally on GNOME, and specifically, cursors should scale properly on Wayland with high DPI displays, which is pretty cool. You also have a host of other changes. For example, you can now display the activities view by pressing any of the super keys on your keyboard. Sometimes you have one on the right of the spacebar and one on the left. Both can now display the activities view. Also, new windows are centered by default in GNOME 48, which thank goodness for that because that is the only logical way that makes sense to have your open windows and then move them to where you want on a smaller screen maybe it makes more sense to display the windows haphazardly somewhere where there's space but on an ultra wide or a big resolution monitor you really don't want to have to crane your neck to the right or to the left or to the bottom every time there's a window opened and you don't want to have to move your eyes so centered windows make sense all in all, GNOME 48 feels really super smooth. Even on this VM where I'm recording things, it has never felt as responsive as this. This is on VirtualBox, which is really not renowned for being super fast or smooth. I don't have anything additional installed and it feels basically like using it on a real computer, which is nice. And on a spare laptop that I have where I installed Fedora Rawhide with uh, GNOME 48, it's a old Slimbook laptop, three or four years old with an old Ryzen CPU. It still runs extremely well and extremely smoothly. So just for that, it is worth the upgrade. But that's not all there is in GNOME 48. Because, well, obviously you have a new version of a desktop, so you need to have a revamped or changed settings. And the big change here is the new well-being category. Now, this will feel pretty bare bones compared to what you can find on a smartphone, for example, because all it does is track the time you've spent today and the next day and the next day and during the week. But that's about it. You don't have per app time tracking because maybe that would be a bit too invasive in terms of data being collected and you can't really set uh, screen limits per application. What you can do though is set screen time limits with a daily limit in terms of hours and or minutes and your computer will turn to grayscale by default when you have exhausted this time. You'll also get a notification, of course, telling you that you've passed that. Now, there is a bug or a weird behavior, which is if you set the screen time limit to 12 hours and then one minute or, yep, yeah, one minute or zero minutes, it's going to tell you that you've exhausted your time limit. It should be zero here, not 12. I don't know how they handled this, but this doesn't feel like it's supposed to do that. Now, on top of that, you have reminders that you can set for your eyesight and for movement. So you might know that you're not supposed to look at a display for hours and hours and hours. You need to rest your eyes and at least move them to the side from time to time. This lets you have this kind of notification. Same for movement. It will alert you when it's time to get off your chair and move that ass. I think it's nice. You can set those durations here, even though I really would have liked them to put some custom inputs here so you can set exactly the duration of each break and the interval between each break. So it's a nice first implementation, but it really needs to go much more in depth to be a viable well-being implementation. You need per app limits and you need to be able to set the breaks, durations and reminders with exact specific times that work for you specifically. This is, in my opinion at least, a bit too simple. Now, GNOME 48 also implements the global keyboard shortcuts portal, meaning applications 
can now implement various shortcuts and add them to your system and when you press those shortcuts the apps actually do something even though they are not focused that's for Wayland of course because on X11 every app can do that because every app is basically a keylogger on X11 if you really think about it. This has been a big limiting factor for Wayland when using GNOME and so now you finally have access to that feature. So whether you use something accessibility related, whether you use uh, OBS or a screen recorder or anything else, you will have access to those shortcuts provided of course the app implements access to that portal but I guess most applications will hurry up and do it because this is a really big gain in terms of functionality. Now the power settings have been split in two now. You've got the general category that shows you the various power plans that you can enable. You can now also show the battery percentage but that already existed in GNOME as far as I can remember. You also have now the power saving options that are being split. There are obviously way more when you're recording something that actually has a battery. Now, theoretically, you also have power charging limits, uh, which lets you basically turn a little toggle on and it tells your computer to never charge above 80% of your battery. So if you leave it plugged in for long periods of time, the battery will not degrade too quickly. Problem is it doesn't appear obviously in a VM, but it also doesn't appear on any of the two laptops. I tried Fedora Rawhide and Gnome OS on, so maybe you need something specific, but in my testing, even with all updates applied, it doesn't show up. Now another simple change, but you might see that happen to more settings pages over time is this new libadvita component uh, for basically choosing various options in the same row. Uh, this is a component for scaling factors, but this will obviously land in more and more pages where it's relevant and where it makes sense. Now GNOME 48 also comes with a brand new app, it's called Audio Player or Decibels if you want the code name, but GNOME has the common sense of using the app's function as its name, which I think is good. It's a very, very simple app, it lets you play audio files, you can change the playback speed with varying degrees of precision, you can move back 10 seconds or up 10 seconds, and you can obviously change the volume as well, play and pause, and that's about it, you can scrub that's it. It's just here to play audio files. Very simple one, but GNOME did not have one previously. Of course, most distributions plugged that app gap with a music player or a music library organizer, uh, but at the very least now you've got that default app. Whether distros ship it or not will depend on the distros themselves. Now the image viewer also gained image editing capabilities, uh, very slight image editing capabilities, but you can change the aspect ratio of the image. You can set it as being either portrait or landscape. You can rotate the image and you can flip it horizontally or vertically. It's very basic, but it's nice to have access to that because at the very least, you don't have to open something like a Pinta, Gimp, Krita, Inkscape or whatever else you wanted just to do very simple edits. You also have the option to save it as the original or to create a new one, which is good. Now, if you ever happen online upon some flat pack URLs that you can click, well, GNOME software will now handle them and open the applications page directly. So it's a nicer experience and it redirects you straight to the GNOME software application. A GNOME Calendar got a slightly improved event editor dialog, notably in the time slot section and the start and end date section, and the order of events in the sidebar has also been improved, so it's more logical. GNOME Maps has some redesigned icons here and there, and a redesigned dialog that you can access if you can sign in to OpenStreetMaps to edit points of interest. GNOME's web browser Epiphany now has a better history dialogue and a simplified interface to import and export bookmarks and passwords. You can now just pick a file and it's going to import your stuff. It's a bit easier to use. The privacy reports dialogue has been changed a little bit, but it's still like relatively bare bones. You just know which websites you've opened and how many trackers there are, but that's about it in there. Epiphany still is not really an option for most people because it just doesn't have extension support. It started being worked on, but as far as I can tell, it hasn't really progressed, or at least it hasn't progressed to a point where you can take a Firefox or Chromium extension and add it to Epiphany, which instantly makes it unsuitable for a lot of people. If you don't need extensions, it's fine. If you do, you just have to stick to something else. Now, all in all, GNOME 48 is a big release, even though visually there are not a lot of changes. 
the changes are still there. They are just mostly behind the visual interface. It's the smoothness, the responsiveness, the better frame rates when you're using GNOME on a lower end computer. It's the more complete Wayland support with global shortcuts. You also have the digital well-being related stuff, even though that's a bit niche and that's still not completely finished, I think. Now, all the GNOME apps are still really basic and simple, and I'm sure that if you felt that GNOME was too limiting for you, it really still is. But it does show a trend towards adding more features and more options for users, and that trend has been going on for a few versions now. So hopefully, this will reconcile a lot of people with GNOME as a desktop. There's also a lot more to come in the future with the Sovereign Tech Foundation projects, like, for example, home directory encryption. So you can encrypt every single directory for every single user without encrypting the entire system. There's also a new accessibility framework being worked on and some of that work already landed in the Orca screen reader and in the on-screen keyboard as well. There's also the USB portal that lets applications access one USB device instead of being able to access all of your device or none of your device, which is a big security improvement as well. Now, personally, I still think KDE moves faster than GNOME, but I do have to recognize that GNOME is probably the most polished desktop environment on Linux, the nicest looking, the more cohesive, and if you like extensions, you can really make it work just as well as KDE or just as well as anything you'd want. Personally, if I use GNOME, I'm a vanilla GNOME user. I don't really add a lot uh, apart from maybe system tray icons because seriously, this is needed. But for most people, extensions will fix the app gaps and the problems that you might have with that desktop. I will stick to KDE for now, but it's getting harder and harder to ignore that GNOME is actually really good. Just like our sponsor, Tuxedo Computers. You know about them by now. They make laptops and desktops that ship with Linux pre-installed. I only use their devices these days to do everything related to that channel. Any of my podcasts, anything I do for patrons or YouTube members, it's all done on a Tuxedo computer. My gaming needs are served exclusively by a Tuxedo Cube as well. They just have a big range of computers that fits every price point, every need. They ship to most countries in the world. You have plenty of keyboard layouts and options. They're just really, really good. So as always, the link to their devices is in the description of the video. Check them out if you want to support Linux and you want to give your money to a company that actively contributes to the system you use every day. So thanks for watching. You know where all the usual YouTube buttons are. Do check out GNOME 48 uh, if you have the time. And in the meantime, thank you all for watching. And I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.